2024, what's on the horizon? Well, first of all, we've got the, the yen carry trade, and that really kind of is what sparked a lot of this problem that we're seeing in the markets over the past couple of weeks. Actually, that ended was mid to late July, where what happened is, is Japan raised their interest rates, but it also brought their currency down. And what, what had been happening is people had been borrowing current, you know, money in, in Japan yen at a lower interest rate and then investing in, in aggressive things like NVIDIA and tech stocks and high high return kind of things. But when that started breaking, um, that caused uh, almost like a panic sell in in that those high flying tech sectors. I'm also wondering if there are a couple of other sectors that might have got hit as well, but that's where it all started. And I'm just going to take you through the main uh, market indexes and show you how that when it fell off and it definitely started with tech and then it moved to the broad markets and then actually went into to small cap, which which I don't have, but it, it kind of was a, a cascading effect. It wasn't all at once. It was a very stepped thing and money flow really didn't back it up until this, you know, the last week or so. So it was really odd sell off, but I can show you where we got defensive and, and why, and that'll be a fun thing. And then we're also going to look at is, is recession back on the table. It very well might be. Uh, my thesis has been that it's going to still a little bit far out, but we've got one of the signals is about to flip, and I'll show you that too. Uh, volatility spikes that all plays into this, uh, and then how and yeah, I said how and where we got we got defensive, so we'll get to that. Let's start off with all right. This is the yield curve, right? So the the yield curve has been inverted for I mean, a few years now, and what what happened that is it means that short term interest rates are paying a better interest rate than long term, meaning the two year treasury is paying more than the ten year treasury. Uh, and when that happens, it's called an inverted yield curve. And historically, when that is inverted and then it uninverts, crosses back above this line, that's usually pre-recession. I mean, in almost every time in history, it is. You go back to other other times it happens, it's, it's the same, same effect. But it's a good 12 to 18 months ahead of time. So there's time. I don't think we're, we're there yet. I don't think the market's about to fall apart. I think we could have some a good ball from here. But... Things are going to get interesting and volatility is certainly higher and we'll get that as well. But yeah, so we just are at one. So this is right about to uninvert right there. Uh, so if it does, yeah, then we're theoretically the clock is ticking that we've got 12 to 18 months till a recession starts. So I'm absolutely keeping that in mind and how to be defensive and even how to profit from that. And that's something very much that we are looking at here right now. Uh, volatility. Volatility. The, so the market goes up on low volatility and it falls on high volatility. For the most part, uh, there's also the saying that, you know, if you're invested in all days, you'll miss the, be the best days. But the problem is the best days happen right after the worst days. A uh, great example is this past week. Uh, some We've had some crazy movements in the 2 3% up and down. But the big days follow the bad days. So they, it all kind of washes. And what happens is when you've got these higher volatility, it tends to be in a down trending market. When volatility subsides and calms down, you tend to get this nice up market. Uh, so we had a crazy, crazy spike up into the 40s, which is really a rare occurrence. I mean, almost every maybe two years. Last time it happened was in 2022 here. It happened in the COVID crash in 2018. Anytime there's a, a more significant problem in the market, you'll see it reflected in this in this number. So, But I also want to see this come back down below really this 20 line, this blue I've got here is kind of a noted of that's really where things calm down. And, and when it's there, the market can run up a little more steadily and, and consistently. Until then, you know, big moves in both directions are probably going to happen back to back. So we might have a great day. Today's rebounding off of yesterday's bad day, but we could see tomorrow give it all back. Uh, we're just in that environment. And the VIX is telling us that we're still there for now for a little bit longer. I think even now this is about 25, 25 and a half. So this is really not coming down. Um, so, so the fear in the market is still there and, and it's something to be cautious of for now. So this is the NASDAQ. I want to show you where we got out. So we... This was back in uh, July 18th. We had the first yellow and then we had the second one there. So something was falling apart back here. And then we did actually sell out there before things got much, much worse. I'd always love to hit hit the top, but that's just not the reality of, of what we do. I'm always looking for the blues to get back in. So you can see blue here was a nice setup for a great run back here, blue, and then it ran one day of yellow. I always give it a couple days because sometimes you get these one day fake outs, one day fake out, and then it becomes real. Uh, we had two in a row and that's really what gave us the, the, the conviction to to play it safe in the NASDAQ area. And then secondarily, the S&P. Now, this didn't hit the second yellow until the 25th, a whole week later. Um, so this was still going up and actually looking completely fine while the NASDAQ was falling apart. And then again, that's the NVIDIAs. That's the big name tech companies that had really the run has really been concentrated just in those spaces. So we're now, we saw this start to play in. And then even later, small cap didn't start showing weakness until around here. It really was a cascading effect. It was the the tech, and then it was the broad market, and then it got small cap, which has been 
trying to, to do okay all year, but it just can't quite get there. That's how that set played out. And even now, so we're looking at our RG, that's that's what the, the color bars on our chart were. Everything is still orange or red. There's really no reason on pretty much every major index that we follow. There's no reason to be invested in it. Secondarily, DMI, which is directional momentum, is I think of it as who's in charge. Are the buyers or the sellers in charge? If this is a false red, that means the, the sellers are still in charge. Even though the market's bouncing today, There's it's just a rebound. So it, it's hard to say if the trend has actually changed. And this is saying it really hasn't just yet. And then the slope is something that we've done and that's, does the DMI confirm? And, and if these are green, uh, it kind of confirms that the DMI is in a downtrend. And even if there's a good update, that's more opportunity to trim or to even look at getting short. We didn't do hedging on this pullback for a couple of reasons. Cause I, I'd like to do it when the macro trend is down, when money flow is really flowing out of the market. And we really never got to that point. So we really just did more of a reduction and not a hedge. So at some point, if going back to the recession scenario, if we get that, we will be hedging and hedging heavily, but we're just not there yet. I can show you our longer term money flow. Uh, so back here in April, we did actually, we're doing some hedging. So this is what it looks like when we get these drops below this line, then I'm like, okay, what do I need to, we need to really get on lockdown, protect, or even look at the short side of how do we make money when the market falls. But this never went there. It, it had a good sell-off, but it never really broke that line. So it really was hard to be too concerned as much as that that pullback was uglier than, certainly more than expected. I think the S&P is now around seven and a half now. Typically it's around five. So it's bad. It's not terrible. We did get out. We've missed a good chunk of it. So I'm not too concerned. I just, any losses are annoying and frustrating, but if we can keep losses to a minimum, we have a lot of signals now that can help us get in a little bit sooner, a little bit quicker, a little bit more aggressively to recapture when the market jumps up, which really goes back to the charts I was showing you. We get those blue bars. We're going to be like, okay, let's look at starting to build positions back in the market sooner than we would have before. And I'm finding that's really helping in our management. Let's go back into the money flow. So money flow, again, it did not go negative until this month. So the sell-off really happened, started happening with that mid July, uh, and it did get weak, but it was still positive, it was, which was crazy because I think that's where small cap had the huge jump up while everything else was falling. And that really kind of offset it and, and it made it look like money still coming into the market. And it was, it was just going to a different place. It was very concentrated. But now, now we're well below this 200, which I'm like, okay, this is also a weak market. If this can push back above here, then that's one of those tells that we might be out of the woods. Although we had that same happen in June, it touched up for a bit and got weak before it finally broke through. So my gut feeling right now says we're going to retest the lows, or at least touch them again before we get, get the rebound. So it's, we're in a play it safe area. We're worried we've reduced risk a fair amount, certainly to half to a third uh, of full allocations at this point for most models. I feel like we're in an okay place. If the market just takes off uh, and we miss it or, n or not fully miss it, we will have something still invested to catch it. So I think we're in a good place there, but yeah, money flow doesn't back it up, but long-term is still, Still good. So look at that. And sectors. This is another thing. We had several sectors that never went negative. Um, actually, a couple over here. Let me see. Healthcare stayed over there, and basic materials were here until a few days ago. So a good part of the market, most of the defensives, stayed positive for quite some time. I mean, I think we even own some utilities still. They're ignoring everything else that's happening. Like, you look at utilities right now, you think there's nothing wrong, but it's counter against the market. So we hold that a little bit, and that's that's been helping offset. Uh, in some models, not, not all of them, but some. But yeah, we're still only still seeing three to eight. This is certainly not positive, but if these start turning green, we see positive rollovers on MACDs, that would be something interesting to watch for, to see them move back to the positive side. And then we'll see, you know, growth coming back into the market and that'll be a time to be, get back in and be aggressive. On the sector rotation, very obviously the small, or the technology is way, way down here in the lagging. I seem to recall last month, I think when we did this webinar, it was up here in the leading. It was by far the, the strongest, and it just kind of went through the, the week all the way down to here. The other, the green here, this is XLY. This is the um, consumer discretionary. That is largely Amazon. Really, this is tech, tech down here. XLC is like the Facebooks and the Googles. They're trying to come back sooner, so we'll, we'll have to see what happens. And then energy, for some reason, followed them right out. But again, we're all clustered here. For all other sectors, there's utilities up in the green leading with like ignoring everything else that's happening, but everything else being over here and weakening, weakening is not weak. It means you want to watch it. You know, there's maybe something's not right, but it's not, it's not failing it. Once we cross into this red box, it's like, okay, there's a problem here. We need to be out of whatever's in here. Uh, but a lot of the market still isn't there. And then we've got a couple is so once they push into this blue improving, then it's like, okay, as I said, when it turns blue, it's when you start looking at buying and we're just not there yet.
But you can see the setup is, is very good. We've got enough strength in, the, in some pockets of the market. It might not be too long. But with this push that far and tech pushing and pulling the market in both directions, we could still see a retest of the lows. And I think that's very possible. And one last thing to show you, this was wild on Monday. Several brokerages went out, their platforms went down, being Schwab and Fidelity and Vanguard and, and the big ones. What's wild is Robinhood typically goes down. It's, it's almost common to see Robinhood go down when, when the market gets fast acting and a lot, there's a lot of activity going on. Uh, they tend to go down so you can't trade or, or even access their platforms. But to see it happen on the big names, that, that's fascinating. But the good part that I found is Axos and Altruist are two primary custodians, never had a problem. We had no problem doing logging in, checking uh, accounts, making trades if, if needed. So we had no problem. So I'm very grateful that the, our technology partners are holding up very, very well in this environment. Thank you.